There we go. All right. All right. Take it away, Sean. Well, hi, everybody, and uh, welcome tonight to tonight's live. Um, it's all about the mandrill and uh, carving a uh, catch-all tray. We'll uh, be showing a video of the carve going through, and uh, we'll discuss what we did, how we do it, and answer questions uh, along the way that you guys may have. You got anything to add, Jim? Now, right now, let's go ahead and hop over to the the pictures, so we can so we can see what we were working on, how we had things set up. So, the picture we're seeing right here. This is actually after I had completed the pocket carve part of the cutout, and I was getting ready to change bits. So, this entire carve was done with two bits. We used our six millimeter end mill which is part of our quarter inch bit kit and we also used a half inch 90 degree v groove bit for the fine detail of the lettering one thing that's a little different that we did with that picture is when i was in between phases and stages of the project because this was done in three steps using that three millimeter piece of scrap wood matched up to my safe height so that allowed me to set my bit at the same height while i was switching bits even though i stayed centered right over that pocket that had already been cut out but we'll show that a little more in depth and more detail on how we did that as we go forward so this is our end result there with that, that catch-all tray you can see right here small Small project, took a few hours throughout the course of the day. I was able to just set it up and let it run, so. It's about eight and a half by five and a half inches at their widest and uh, longest points. Uh, designed that in V-Carve uh, months ago. I want you to take people through the steps in V-Carve real quick if we can, Sean. I don't know if you uh, had that or not. Just so people can see how you did this, because this is not a typical like a 3D carve. This was just a vector carve. Yeah, just this a vector is a carve. Different. Yeah, give me a sec. I'll open it up. And while he's doing that, like I said, we used our quarter inch end mill. We carved out this entire center section. I then switched to the V groove bit to do that detail lettering there at the bottom. And then I went back to the quarter inch bit to do the perimeter profile cut to get that removed from my piece of wood yeah okay so i'm ready to go i'll present uh my screen Oop. Uh, screen sharing is just is that? okay hopefully that works Gonna our work. apologies on the delay i kind of threw that at sean <laughs> yeah on his toes it's all good Okay, so here's uh, V-Carve desktop, um, and you'll notice the, the vectors. I have uh, the outer profile of the guitar uh, body, um, my inner pocket cut profile. Um, I don't know. Can you guys see my mouse? Yes, and, we can. Okay, perfect. And then uh, you can see my text, and then we used uh, the, uh, the V-Bit uh, toolpath for the text. And uh, that's that's a really nice tool path. It does a lot of uh, calculating automatically for you. Um, so we'll we'll take you through the tool paths right now. Uh, so for the pocket, you would uh, select the uh, pocket tool path, and then it opens up, and you can select your tools, your depth of cut, uh, your type of uh, your type of carve, whether you want an offset or a raster. Um, raster is left and right. Offset is uh, circular or uh, starts in the center, works its way out. Um, do your ramp plunge moves. And uh, that's just so the bit doesn't uh, jam into the material uh, as deep as your, uh, your passes are. Um, and you would edit all your passes. Uh, same, uh, same thing as easel and uh, uh, carve coat um probably different windows but you can edit your depths per pass 
Uh, I have one eighth right now, 0.125 inches. Um, and then your step overs, depending on the type of carve. If you're doing uh, uh, a pocket, like a clear out, you might want to do uh, larger uh, step overs just so you can uh, clear those pockets out quicker. Um, smaller step overs are for more detail. Um, that, that will impact any, sometimes you'll see that the ridge is left and that can be a, a factor in your step over settings. Yes. Especially if you're running a smaller bit, too large of a step over leaves a gap in between each pass and that'll leave those ridges in your pocket. You can actually see with the, the settings there where Sean had this at that 30%, I'll hold this up to the camera here a little closer. You can see that that left a very smooth finish inside the pocket using just a quarter inch end mill. And, uh, and then, uh, since this was three different, uh, three different tool pass, um, the second one you do, you, te you I tend to always do my profile cuts, my cutouts last. So, uh, with the V-bit uh, or the V-carve engraving tool path, you have a start depth. And in this particular case, because we wanted it at uh, the bottom of the pocket, I had to set the depth, uh, the, the same, uh, the start depth, the same depth as the pocket. And we carved a half inch de uh, pocket into it. So it ha I had the start depth had to be at a half inch. And then uh, flat depth. Um, I put none because um, the V-bit, uh, the cutting edges of the V-bit would touch the outlines of the vectors. So as it comes in, it'll go only deep enough until um, the, the cutting edges will touch each side of the T here and it won't go any deeper. Um, if I had a larger circle or something and I was using the V-bit to uh, hog out that material, then I'd want... A flat depth or it would probably go through the material because it would never reach the uh, the edges with the bit itself and then you don't get to choose the type of carve because it does its own tool path uh, so you don't get to choose offset or raster or plunge rates or anything like that um, and then it's very important that when you do use a v-bit that you have the proper degree and the proper bit diameter um, if not your V carve is not going to come out looking like you expect it to. Um, and I did have to change that from Sean's original design because Sean designed this. I did the carving and I only had a 90 degree bit where he had a 60 degree. Yeah. So that's always something to take into consideration and something that I would always, when I first started out, I assumed certain things about my V bit that were wrong and yeah never worked out i got frustrated one uh, thing back to your uh, pocket cut real quick sean okay sean mentioned editing your tool and you can adjust your depth per pass there well there's also one other spot you can do that so he has it set to a eighth of an inch right now if you click on that edit passes button that's right there you can change the number of passes there at the bottom of the screen and it will automatically recalculate the depth per pass for you. And what I did is I actually took that down to a 16th of an inch. I wanted to do it a little more conservatively, make sure that we didn't have any issues with the machine binding up and I wanted to be able to run a higher feed rate. So I was actually able to run with the mandrill at 15 inches a minute. I started it out at 12 by slowing it down in easel, but then accelerated back up to the 15 inches per minute. And that's and that's another aspect of uh, the sender software, easel, G sender, UGS, and open builds. Um, they all have, um, you can set um, what you would consider a good speed uh, to start off for most materials. And then you can always, uh, bring it down to 10% of the normal speed, or you can bring it up to 200% of the, uh, of what, of your start speed. Um, it get, so it gives you a good, uh, good range. So if the car is going really good and you think you can speed it up, you can just 
tap it by one percent or ten percent at a time to get as much uh as much speed as you can to cut that carving time down uh, and then uh profile cuts so this is this was the third and final cut i didn't add tabs onto this one uh because usually when i do mine i use double-sided tape and uh i usually have really good luck with just using double-sided tape and when i do the cutouts um i always have a sac sacrificial board underneath just just in case and um, and I did not use that method, so I went in and edited your toolpath to add tabs to it. Right. Um, I forgot to mention that to you when I sent it to you. I figured uh, it out pretty quick. <laughs> That's good. I didn't want to fling the carve across the room when that final pass went through. So. No, it was pretty small, so it probably wouldn't have stayed stationary. That's for sure. Um, so... Yeah, you can add tabs. Uh, you can add as many as you want. Try not to have tabs in tight corners or recesses or rounds like this. It makes it very difficult to cut them out later. You want mm -hmm. them on a, a flat side as much as possible. So I would have probably put one here, one down here. For this size, I probably would have only used two. Uh, no, sorry, one here. And I probably I would have had one here and then one here. You can't have one down here because it material is not uh, uh, big enough for that there. So that I is, had that is one advantage with VCarve desktop is if you add tabs, its default setting is to avoid curved lines. Yes. So if you click, go ahead and click on the add tabs to toolpath so we can see where that comes up. And if you edit your tabs, But right there, that placement section, it says to avoid corners and curved regions. Mm -hmm. So you can also, hold on. You can also move them around to where you want. So I want one there. I want one here. Well, let's go here. And then this guy right there. So you can place them wherever you want. You can add as many tabs as you want. You can do also do it by if you want to do a consistent distance of eight inches. Uh, let's go with, yeah, let's go, yeah, let's go with eight. Uh, minimum number of two, max number of ten. Avoid corners and curves, and it kind of does the same thing. It likes this spot here for whatever reason, but there's nothing to really grab onto. Um, so I, I I wouldn't want it there. Again, I'd put it here, but there's many different uh, variations you can do with that uh are there any questions about v carve or setting up uh, a vector carve i don't see any questions as of yet Okay. Well, then I'll close this out. And uh, well, before you close it, let's make sure people understand saving your toolpath if you're going to use easel or whatnot. Okay, that's a good point. So saving your toolpath. So you make the you you make all your toolpaths. You and then uh, when you if you like the way it previews. Uh, preview all that's what I wanted to do and if you like the preview you go to save your tool pass and if you are going to use easel as your g-code sender if you're comfortable with easel and you want to use easel as your g-code sender um, and you work in inches easel has its own post processor and a specific inches G code file, as well as they have a millimeter specific millimeter G code file. If you're using UGS open builds or uh, G sender like myself, um, the post processor would be just GRBL inch or millimeters with whatever unit of measurement you work in. So then you just click that. 
um, always save them as multiple files because you're going to be doing one, changing your bit, two, changing your bit, three, changing your bit, four, five, six, what have you, however many you're doing. Um, so you're always going to have multiple files. I never save it as one because we don't have a bit changer and you got to do the manual bit change. And easel will not accept them if it's all in one file anyway. Um, George has a quick question as far as vCarve being shipped. No, vCarve desktop is a separate program that is available for purchase directly from Vectric. That's Vectric.com. We'll post that here in the comments as well. There is an additional cost to that. I believe the licensing for vCarve desktop is $349. That's a one-time cost only. Um, I believe there are upgrades. If you go, if they get beyond a couple versions past where you start, there is an upgrade fee, but I haven't hit it yet in the last three years. So vCarve is not included with the machine, unfortunately. That's something we, we can't offer at this time. No, no. It's a, it's a standalone software. Uh, we, nothing to do with us at all. Yeah, um, we, are, we are trying to get a partnership in place with Vectric so that hopefully our tool and machine selection will be available within that software. But that's still in the early parts of the discussion. Um, Sean mentioned the post processor for easel. If you wish to use the Vectric software, you can go to the machine menu in easel and there's a button for drivers and post processors there. And that will take you to their download page and you can download the Vectric Aspire post processor, which works with all of the Vectric software. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's uh, three levels of their CAD CAM software. You have Vectric, uh, VCarve Desktop. VCarve Pro has a few couple more features than VCarve Desktop. The most notable one is working on a bed that's larger than 24 inches by 24 inches or standard 6060 size. So if you end up getting the expansion, uh, VCarve Desktop won't be able to utilize the whole bed area. And then they have... Uh, then they have uh, Vectric Aspire, which is kind of their flagship. And that's where all their uh, really fancy tools come into play. Along uh, with a fancier price tag, I believe Aspire is approximately $2,000 in licensing fees. Yeah, I think it's 2500 Canadian for me, which I'm really considering getting. All right, we have uh, another quick question. Can we use a bowl bit in VCarve for this type of carve? Uh, you can, yes. Um, you would just have to, uh, uh, let's kick you, let's see here. Um, uh, let's go back in here and then let's go select. Uh, no. Yeah, we're in the pocket. Yeah, we're in the pocket. Select. And then uh, you would, if you don't have a bowl bit uh, specific, which I don't think I do, you can always make one. So you can always... Down at the bottom. The tool. What's that? Sorry. Third from the bottom. Oh, so yeah, this is a, um, what do you call this? This is a tool. Uh, they're, they're a tool library. Yeah, this is a tool library. Thank you. Um, that I got from uh, uh, a bit manufacturer, uh, IDC. Um, and uh, he supplies, they supply, uh, bull bits and end mills and ball noses and all kinds of bits. And uh, so they have, they do have a bull bit, so you can use it. Um, but if you wanted to add your own bit, you can add a tool under select a tool group. Well, I'm going to go to one that I never use anyway. So let's go with, uh, do I use these ones? Whatever, we'll add one here. And then you can uh, tool type, uh, call it a form tool. No selected vectors for form tool. Okay, that's fine. Um, and then you just make sure you put, maybe it's not a form tool. Tapered, ball nose, V-bit, radius 10 mil. I don't know what you would put that as. Yeah, I'm not sure on that one. I I personally have not worked with bull bits. Not yet. yet. Me either. 
Uh, let's try, radius end mill. Okay, so you put it in as a as an end mill. Uh, so we can call it an end mill. Next, and the, your next option was radius end mill. Was sure. there? Oh, perfect. There we go. So radius end mill. I didn't even see that. So whatever inches you work, you just have to make sure you put in the proper diameter and uh, the proper tip radius. And that should all be uh, on your bit, uh, uh, bit documentation when you purchase it. And then you just, if you got, a, if you got two flutes, usually there, they'd be a two flute bit, I would assume. Uh, and then you just go create and then, and then you can add your depths per pass. Uh, you can set your standard step over for your bit. you used uh, your spindle speeds. So with the stock 500 watt, 10,000, uh, your feed units, you could go uh, 80 inches a minute, or you probably want to, that's pretty quick. So you go down to uh, start at 10, work your way up your plunge rate. Plunge rate's usually half, half, uh to 60 percent of your feed rate is what you'd want your plunge rate to be because you don't want it going as fast as your feed rate but at the same time you don't want to go in slow so slow that it really slows your carve down if you have a lot of raising and lowering throughout your carve uh more important with uh 3d carves uh so i hope that answered that question so George also asked, let's see, uh, any software come with the product? We do not include specific software. We recommend software. For most users, we say use uh, Easel. For most functions, most basic use, Easel is going to work great for probably 80 to 90 percent of the customers out there. You can use the free version of Easel as a g-code sender a lot of your basic design can also be done in easel in the free version the downside to easel is that monthly subscription cost for that easel pro that you need to do it also has a little bit more limited capability of bit options as compared to vcarve so the only software that we include with it is going to be your drivers just so you have them available we don't use any proprietary software on our machines. It's all open source available on the open market. Um, your other question, if you have a PDF drawing, does VCarve know how to process it? I have not tested that uh, with VCarve yet. I'm looking to see real quick here. Sorry, what was that? Can you use a PDF in VCarve? You can import bitmaps i have never actually tried to import a pdf but i i do a quick google search maybe you find it i'm uh, thinking the the issue you might run into with pdf files is in most software that can bring a pdf in it takes into account all the dead space around the document as well yeah i don't even think I'm i have sure a I'm checking their website real quick to see if it'll allow that. Right, let's just see if I can open up this. Fail to load image. Yeah, it won't, uh, won't load a PDF. Okay. Well, that answers that question. Yeah. However, you can take a screenshot of a PDF and then uh, save it as an image file and bring it in that way. Okay, Jeff commented that IDC does have the tool library download, as Sean mentioned. Some mm -hmm. of your other software or bit manufacturers will also provide tool information specifically for them. Yeah, it's, uh, I believe Amana has theirs and uh, whatnot too, but they're a little more pricey of a bit. And... Mm -hmm. George also asked, assuming easel doesn't work with PDFs, I don't know of too many CAD CAM type softwares that will accept a PDF natively. No, no, apart from Lightburn, it's, I think Lightburn's the only one. And even with Lightburn, it just views it as an image. Yeah, 
that you can then trace. Yeah. Um, we also had another comment, adding a bit manually would be the way to go in easel as well, as it doesn't have an option for radius end mills. Again, that's one of the limitations of easel is they have a very limited options for bit selection. It's something they're always working on, but I don't believe they've added those as yet. So. Mm -hmm. I'm glad I hid that. Stop. I wanted to hit stop. <laughs> My bad. <clears throat> so, is that it for the questions or move along? That's all the questions we've got so far. If anyone else has any other questions, put them up there and we'll try and get them throughout the course of everything. But so we've, we've talked about getting our tool paths set within Vectric. We've talked about saving our tool paths. As Sean mentioned, we want to save them as individual files. And you can then load those into easel. There is the import G code option. So you would just import that G code and it, it's going to look a little bit different on your screen than if you were building your project within easel. It'll just show the blue lines where it's going to carve at. So you have to know, are you centering on the, the board? Or are you working from the lower left corner? Whatever origin you've selected when you designed your prog project. In this case, we went off of the center. So why don't we go ahead and run to the video and you can see how this ran. So again, this was starting in the center. This was starting with our pocket cutout. You can kind of see the faint lines there why I, I marked the board to find the center of my work area. And I admittedly was not watching this like a hawk. So there is some sawdust buildup as we're carving along here. Again, this was with the mandrel, quarter inch end mill. At this point, I was running 15 inches a minute, 16th of an inch depth per pass. And that was with the spindle at 100% speed, so approximately 10,000 RPM. Obviously, we have time lapse to this, so you don't have to watch the entire two hours of carve time. Yeah. I think this is the final pass. But that's the kind of chips you do want to see. You want to see fairly large chips because that's what's going to keep the bit cool and not overheat and not burn the wood. Um, if you're getting um, much bigger than that, then you're 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 feeding it too aggressively. Um, and if you're getting much finer than that, you're not cooling the bit. You're heating the bit up too much, and then uh, you're just going to end up screwing with the uh, with the the temper of the metal and it's just going to soften the metal and then dull the dull the cutting edge a lot quicker so so yeah at this point you, he needed to do a bit change now there's a couple different ways you can do a bit change um, when i talked to sean he mentioned that he will jog the machine to one side so it's over our work surface you just have to track how far you've moved it and then you can lower it down to the surface of the material set that as your z height move it back over to the original start point and go from there i used an alternate method i actually let the machine come to a stop after its first run and i used a piece of scrap material that is three millimeters thick laid that on top of my work surface because my my safe height where it stops at is three millimeters above the work surface so i was able to just slide that piece of scrap wood in there and now my bit is just resting on that piece of material so i can switch bits put the new v bit in there let it rest on that material and tighten the chuck down now i know i'm at that exact same height and by doing so, as I run the second G code file to do that profile or the V carve cut, as I go through the steps to start my carve and easel, I can just tell it use last position because I haven't changed the height or position of anything. So it's going to just pick up right where it left off. 
And then I did the exact same steps when I switched back to the quarter inch end mill to do the profile cut. Now that V groove carve that took about two or three minutes. That's the fastest part of this whole process mm -hmm. for this profile cut, because I was doing just a deep cut and it's not doing that offset where it's opening up more material. I'm constantly just cutting down into that same groove. I did go a lot slower on this because I didn't want to potentially overheat anything or bog the spindle down. Just because there's not as much room to get the chips up and out of there. Yeah. So this is where for cutouts, um, specifically with the aluminum beds, you may want to have a, a sacrificial, sacrificial piece of uh, material underneath so you can go that one hundredth or one thousandth of uh, of an inch uh, deeper than the thickness of your material um, or use double sided tape uh, to hold it in place. And you, you can't see it well. If you look at the, uh, the video here, you can see a gap between my work material and the aluminum bed. It's because I had a piece of six millimeter MDF underneath it, spacing it up so that I had that sacrificial piece so that it would not cut into the aluminum. Because while some of these bits can, and these machines can mill soft aluminum, it's not good for the bits to do that unexpectedly. No. It also makes one heck of a racket. <laughs> yeah, I carved into one of the... Uh the aluminum clamps uh, in my early days with the 6060. So at that point, it had completed the profile cut. I had set tabs, but I honestly had my, my depth just a little bit off. But it basically cut through all but just a fraction of a millimeter in a few spots. My, my board may not have been perfectly flat. I didn't run it through a planer before I started or anything. So... I was able to just pop it out and just clean up the edges with a little bit of sanding. I just used a sponge sanding block and that's the end result we came up with. And that basic profile um, of the guitar and the tray um, using the tools, the offset tools and uh, literally took me 10 minutes to create. It didn't take long at all. So sometimes it's a better alternative to use vectors as opposed to always uh, uh, a prefab three-dimensional file for some jobs like this. So do we have any other questions, any comments, need more information? Not seeing any more come in, Sean. Was there anything else we wanted to cover? Well, we've got our, our audience here. Well, apart from uh, uh, setting your Z0 uh, of, uh, after a bit change, um, there are definitely a few different other options you can do, such as zeroing to your uh, machine bed if you don't have uh, uh, flat material left over on a carve, um, as well as... Uh, um, using the Z axis or the Z probes, uh, rather, um, I have, will be, we will be putting a, uh, a video up on, uh, how to use the Z probe and different ways of, uh, zeroing your Z after a cut and a bit change. Uh, so look out for that video. Uh, apart from that, I'm not sure. We did have two more questions. George also asked, was that item composed in V carve or in easel? That one was completely developed in VCarve. Yes. As a vector file and then simply saved the tool paths. I did use Easel to operate the machine. I just took those saved G code files, loaded them one by one into Easel and let it run. But then we also have the question do you find it easier to start from the center versus your zero XY position? Well, the center, if you start from the center, technically that will be your X, Y, zero if you set it that way. Um, I think they're probably meaning as opposed to where easel always tells you to start at that front left corner. Yeah, I I don't like using the front left corner 
for two reasons. Um, one, it's hard to kind of center a wider bit um, uh, when, uh, or specifically a really narrow bit. Uh, if I if I start from the center, I I, I know exactly where it's going to be. So I it's I prefer it. It it's kind of personal preference, really. It, it really is. I'll use the the left corner sometimes if I'm. If I'm just doing a basic carve in a large board and I'm not worried about exact placement because I'm going to cut it out and the rest of my board is waste, I might use the left corner because I'm not viewing it as critical. If I was carving in, say, a slab cut of wood that I need to be in the exact center or in an exact position on it, then I'm going to work off of the center so that I know, like Sean said, your position on your workpiece is right where you want it because you're not going to trim all that away we've got customers that have done carves in the the, the log slices to where you have that irregular shape so you want to make sure that you're positioned right you technically don't have a left front corner in those cases so in in that situation you would also definitely want to go from the center yeah I, it's just something i started doing and i i haven't gone back to lower left corner upper right corner or whatnot again all preference and what you're set up for i for me i don't have a specific place where i slide my material into a, a perfect corner with the root uh with uh, straight edges where my my zero is always the bottom left a lot of people have that set up so it's it's automatic it's easy for them to do that i have irregular shaped pieces of wood like uh, jim mentioned and i just slap it on my my work bed and clamp it down and just what i always mark center and go from center it's just a habit i got into and i think uh, yeah i don't think i see anything else come up as yet so if you're interested in the bits that we did use, again, we have our quarter inch bit set and our V groove bit set available on the website. Um, those will come with the appropriate collet necessary that will allow your stock spindle on all of our machines, the 3018, the mandrill and the silverback. We provide the quarter inch ER11 collet so you can use those bits on all of the, the stock spindles. Um, let's see, I don't think there's much of anything else we had. It was all bits. Like I said, we are working on a, a partnership in the future with Vectric. So, more to come with that. Hopefully, it's uh, some good news. For me, the big thing that we've asked is uh, getting the the machine profile within their setup. So when you when you first install Vectric, you're able to select the machine and that way it automatically knows what your work area is and everything else. So that's one of the big features we're hoping to get with this partnership. Yeah, that'd be handy for sure. Right on. Hold on. Andy's asking hardware for setting up a relay power supply with the Makita router. Oh, Funny you ask that, Andy. Um, that's actually something I'm going to be posting here in the group, hopefully within the next day or two. But I happen to have my prototype sitting right here. Mm. Plastic or ABS enclosure, power cord that plugs into your wall, relay cord that will plug into the spindle output of your mandrel or silverback controller. You simply plug in your Makita router here, plug this into the wall, plug this end into your controller, set your controller speed all the way up so you're feeding the full 48 volts to that relay. You get a couple advantages with that. A, you now have your automatic control of your Makita through your controller. It will start and stop it as necessary. So one complaint maybe, I, not necessarily a complaint concern is when you're using the Makita, when your job stops, the router doesn't shut down. You don't have that 
audible indication if you happen to turned away from the machine it's just still sitting there running the spindle it also now will utilize the emergency stop as of right now if you're using the e-stop with the makita spindle it or the makita router it does not stop the router so this is like i said this is the prototype that i built last week um, i'm going to be getting some more details out on that we're going to post this in the users group trying to gauge interest if there's enough interest in this sort of item, we'll get the parts ordered and I'll start building more of them so we can get them out to uh, a sellable product. It'll probably look very much like this. So we're working on that. We have seen the, the comments in the group where people have asked about that. I know there's a couple people that have made their own setups, but we'd like to be able to offer something that we know has been tested with our machine has all the appropriate wiring. I'm running 16 gauge wire for the outlet, so we don't have to worry about a load. The The relay is rated well above the, the potential load of a Makita router. And I know I've got the right voltage for the 48 volt output. So stay tuned. I'm hoping to, like I said, have that post in the users group here in the next few days. Um, and if you are interested in it, make sure you, you let us know in that post so we can get a, a level of interest so we can start ordering the materials for that. And basically right now, all those will be made right here in Ohio. So you can blame me for all those. <laughs> Leave me out of it, yes. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, I don't see any other questions. You're very welcome, Andy. Uh, like I said, stay tuned for that. We'll get the information out as soon as we can. I wanted to try and do a short video on it, maybe a little more professional than, hey, I just grabbed this. Um, so with that, um, I know we've got a lot of input from our users group. We asked for your input on what these live sessions should consist of. We're taking all that into account so we can start scheduling things going forward. We may not be doing them weekly. It might be bi-weekly or monthly instead, but we are taking everyone's input into account so that we can start putting together a live session for what you, our customers, want to see. So I think that wraps us up for tonight, Sean, unless you had anything else. No, I think, uh, no, I think we went through everything we needed to. All right. Right. Thank you, everyone, and we look forward to seeing you again on our next live session. Have a good evening. Have a good evening, guys. Bye.